So hello everyone. Uh, so it's my, with my great pleasure that uh, I am here to, uh, today to act as a moderator on the first today keynote lecture. Uh, before, just let me uh, to remind you to ask question in the QA window, uh, and please type your question there anytime, as there is no need to wait uh, until the end. Uh, but uh, just a reminder that you can also use the Slack channel to continue discussion after the talk. And please uh, uh, remain respectful in all interaction during the conference. So I'm very pleased uh, to introduce you now our keynote speaker, Bernardo Sabatini. So Bernardo is a professor of neurobiology at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering from Harvard College and a PhD and MD for Harvard Medical School, where he moved back as a PI in 2001 after postdoctoral training in the Carlos Bobola lab. So Bernardo is a recipient of many prestigious awards, including the Howard Huge Investigator Award, and he was recently uh, elected to the National Academy of Science. So uh, let me say that during his career, Bernardo published many seminar papers that have been really shaping the field of Basaganga physiology spanning from study uh, of the biophysical process uh, that control the function of individual synapses uh, to mechanism of synaptic neuromodulation and the relationship between synaptic plasticity and behavior, both in health and in disease state. And to perform uh, uh, this comprehensive analysis of Basaganga function, his group has developed uh, a novel optical, electrophysiological and behavioral approach. So say this, uh, please, Bernardo, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Rafaela. It's um, wonderful to see you again. It's been a long time. And uh, yes, thanks definitely. everybody. Yeah, I was really looking forward to this conference to see many friends. Yeah. Thanks everyone for uh, attending. And I'm gonna tell you about uh, work about dopamine signaling from my lab that's uh, been building over about a decade for now. I hope everybody can see the slides now, and hopefully they're advancing for everybody. Can somebody, yeah, they're advancing, wonderful. Okay, so uh, most of the work I'm going to talk to you about uh, is published, and uh, I'm going to point out where those papers are, but I thought it would be nice to provide an, an overview of, of, uh, of a decade of work as opposed to a small snippet of something that's going on now. And so um, I'm not going to introduce the basal ganglia today. Um, but I'm just going to introduce a few terms. I think we've seen the basal ganglia in, in many presentations. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about uh, the basal ganglia in mice. And I'm going to take a mouse centric uh, view of the presentation. And I'm going to refer to direct pathway neurons as DSPNs, direct uh, stridal projection neurons. And of course, indirect pathway neurons as ISPNs, uh, as, is, as is customary for many people. And so today we're going to talk about the effects of dopamine on the striatum. And uh, I'm going to tell you about some biophysical studies that were done in the dorsal striatum, and then some in vivo studies that were done in the ventral striatum, in the core of the nucleus accumbens. And I'll try to make those distinctions clear as we go along. So like many people at this conference, we're interested in understanding you know, what does dopamine do, and how does it exert its behavioral effects? And in particular, it's important to think about really two kinds of behavioral effects that are quite different. One is the acute effects that dopamine has uh, on a circuit and on behavior. And I think this is really best exemplified by the effects of dopamine on action initiation, on timing, and on vigor. And of course, a very striking example is Parkinson's disease, in which you can have somebody who's very severely debilitated, but on giving them levodopa, they can right away sort of get up and walk. So arguing really about an acute regulation of dopamine on the circuit that's essential for normal motor function. However, of course, there's also the other side of dopamine, which is the kind of chronic effects uh, that are maybe best seen in reinforcement learning models uh, or in drug addiction, in which dopamine alters the circuit in such a way that the future behavior of the animal is changed for very uh, long periods of time. And there's a bit of mystery here as to how dopamine does uh, both of these things. And, and rather, I should really say dopaminergic neurons as opposed to dopamine, because of course, dopaminergic neurons are quite complex and release more than dopamine. So this is a, uh, a, a parasagittal section of a mouse brain showing the sources of dopamine here in the midbrain in the ventral tegmental area and substantia compacta, and the dense innervation that those fibers then release uh, within striatum. And we are an electrophysiology lab primarily, and therefore we started by an electrophysiological perspective. 
And so nearly uh, 10 years ago, um, two people in the lab, Nick Trish and Jun Ding, started to ask a very simple question, which is what does dopamine do to stridal projection neuron firing? And they took an optogenetic approach. And I think you heard from, Jun, uh, sorry, from Nick uh, yesterday, uh, who may have touched on, on some of these uh, subjects. So they did a very simple experiment, which is to obtain whole cell recordings from striatal projection neurons in a slice. These neurons, of course, were labeled so that we could tell whether they were direct or indirect pathway neurons, and then simply looked at the firing properties of these cells under a variety of different conditions. And so here's an example of a uh, recording from a direct pathway spinal projection neuron in which they inject current in order to get a barrage of action potentials. And then they're going to use channel rhodopsin. Uh, they used channel rhodopsin to fire dopaminergic neurons and release dopamine uh, phasically as this neuron was firing. And so what you can see is that at the time of the flash of activation of dopaminergic fibers in this acute brain slice, there was a pause in the firing of the cell, which is then followed by a clear increase in the firing rate of the neuron. And when they waited just a little bit more, then of course the effect of this pause disappeared. There's a clear increase in the firing rate of the neuron. And then waiting even longer, the neuron returned to baseline. And so one could see that there was a transient activation of firing of these cells uh, that in their hands only lasted about 20 seconds or so. Or so. But Mark Bevan has go on, gone on to do some really beautiful work with perforated patch recordings showing that the effects of dopamine on direct pathway neurons can actually last uh, minutes uh, and, and, and are seen as an increase in the activity of these cells, the excitability of these cells over the time course of minutes. So of course, what intrigued us was this pause here. And uh, Nick and, and Jun went on to show that in fact, this pause is caused by GABA release from dopaminergic cells. And as many of you know, it had been appreciated that about 10% of dopaminergic neurons are actually glutamatergic because they express the machinery necessary to package and release glutamate, but it hadn't been known at the time that they could also release GABA. And so I'm not gonna go into the, uh, all of the studies that they did. I'm just gonna show this summary cartoon uh, from, from a, a paper that Nick and I put together in which we outline the really bizarre way in which dopaminergic neurons are GABAergic. And so it turns out that dopaminergic neurons do not have any of the classical machinery necessary to synthesize GABA or to package GABA into vesicles. And so the way they become GABAergic is by the function primarily of a plasma membrane GABA transporter, which is able to capture GABA from the extracellular space, bring it into cytoplasm or the axoplasm, and then it appears to be loaded into vesicles, the same vesicles that have dopamine, by the vesicular monoamine transporter. And we did a whole variety of experiments to show that, uh, that this model is correct. And so this is really interesting because these neurons don't look GABAergic based on their transcriptional analysis or their proteomic analysis, but in fact, they are GABAergic by using these proteins in very different ways than is normally, uh, normally occurs. And so this effect is independent of the GABA synthetic enzymes, GABA, GAD1 and GAD2. Uh, and it's also independent of the normal vesicular GABA transporter, SLC32A1, sorry. But it is dependent on, as I said, the vesicular monoamine transporter and GAD1. And there have been some follow-up studies, uh, one from Jun Ding's lab, showing that a modifier of this process is, in, uh, is an aldehyde dehydrogenase. Uh, which is able to make GABA through an alternative pathway. And in the absence of GAT1, uh, this seems to be a way in which the cell can, can maintain uh, its GABAergic nature. And work from uh, the lab of uh, Ben Philpot has shown that in Angelman's uh, uh, model a mouse, a UBE3A knockout, this GABA release is, is altered. And both studies showed that there were behavioral consequences of this. Although I think it's still fair to say that we don't really understand the context in which GABA release from dopaminergic neurons is relevant to what it does to the circuit. Now, of course, there are other targets of dopamine uh, fibers within the striatum, and there are many different classes of striatal neurons. Chris Straub, when he was a postdoc in a lab collaborating with Nick Trish, uh, did a study of the effects of activity of dopaminergic neurons on cholinergic <clears throat> interneurons, which of course are found within the striatum and comprise a small percentage of all the cells that are there. These cells are rev readily recognized in brain slices, uh, in this case, because they're expressing GFP, but in most cases, just because they're large cells that fire tonically at a few hertz uh, and have very low input resistance. 
And so Chris did exactly the same experiment as I showed you before, but now recording from cholinergic interneurons. And what he saw is that these cells, as expected, were firing along at a low rate, a couple of hertz. And at the time of activating dopaminergic axons, these cells again showed a pause in firing, and now an increase in firing rate as we saw before. But you'll notice here the kinetics are actually quite different, whereas before this increase in firing rate in stridal projection neurons lasted for tens of seconds, here it only lasts for about one second or so, okay? Whereas the pause lasts a little bit longer. And so in whole cell uh, uh, voltage clamp recordings, he was able to look at the currents that underlie this complex phenotype. He was able to see that there were actually three different currents that appeared. One was a very fast outward current here, and then there's a second outward current that in this case is truncated by a very large inward current. And it turns out that these three currents represent GABA acting on GABA-A receptors here. This is this GABA release from dopaminergic neurons, although potentially through a different mechanism than what I showed you before for the stridal projection neurons. The second current is actually dopamine acting on type 2 dopamine receptors and opening presumably GERC channels that are mediating this outward um, uh, current, which is the one that actually mediates the pause that's here. As you can tell, this gab current is so brief in its time course that it can't really account for this longer pause that occurs. We were unable to identify what this inward current was. We did a lot of pharmacology, and we couldn't really figure out what it was or what neurotransmitter mediates it. Steve Rayford's lab and Chris Ford went on to independently both show that in fact, this is due to glutamate release and activation of metabotropic glutamate receptor that signals through trip channels. This is a really odd pharmacology and it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming embarrassed that we couldn't figure it out, but seeing the, the, the oddness of the current that they discovered, I understand why we, we missed it. So because of all of this, what we learn is that in this acute domain, the activity of dopaminergic neurons is mediated, uh, it influences striatum by at least three different neurotransmitters. So dopamine and GABA are both released, we think, in the same vesicle. This is VMAT2 dependent, and we think this is a feature of all dopaminergic neurons, at least within the dorsal stratum and arising from the substantia nigra compact. Something else, glutamate, Chris Ford and Steve Rayport showed, activates cholinergic interneurons, um, and that effect can last uh, you know, a few seconds. And so we have basically glutamate and GABA that are influencing the neurons on this one to 100 millisecond sort of time course, then we have dopamine and glutamate that through metabotropic receptors can influence the circuitry on longer time courses. And then we have effects that last many seconds uh, on SPN activity, as I mentioned, as Mark Bevan has shown, and we showed a little bit. Uh, and then as I'll show you in a minute on biochemistry. So that's a complex picture of the acute regulation of striatal neurons by dopaminergic activity firing. Uh, it's you know, now a challenge to go back in vivo and understand which of those effects are seen as dopaminergic neurons go up and down as an animal experiences environment, and which of those effects are really crucial to proper functioning in the striatal circuit and to things like, uh, like learning. <clears throat> those are studies, of course, that are ongoing. And furthermore, we'd like to understand the contribution of these different neurotransmitters to disease phenotypes like Parkinson's. And please keep in mind that because GABA and dopamine are both dependent on the vesicular monoamine transporter for entering vesicles, pretty much all of the manipulations that have been done to study a Parkinsonian animal, which traditionally are things like 6-hydroxydopamine to kill axons or pharmacological ways of destroying uh, the function of the vesicular monoamine transporter, those will have affected both GABA and dopamine release. Of course, levodopa as a restorative therapy in some cases will presumably only restore dopamine release. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to transition to thinking about the more chronic effects of dopamine release, which is how does dopamine influence future behavior? And of course, as all of you know, dopamine neurons are thought to encode reward prediction errors, and it's thought that this dynamic context-dependent modulation of dopamine neurons increasing their activity at the time of a reward or at the time of a cue that predicts a reward and decreasing their activity at the time in which an expected reward is missed it's thought that these are the signals that are used to induce learning and to modify future behavior. So how can we look at these? Well, we started by asking about what are the effects of dopamine on PK? That was sort of our goal. So remember that direct and indirect pathway neurons differ by the expression of dopamine receptors. So direct pathway neurons express type 1 dopamine receptors, which couple through G-alpha-S, G-proteins, to activate adenoid cyclase. 
which, which produces cyclic AMP, which turns on PK. On the other hand, the indirect pathway neurons express type 2 dopamine receptors that signal through G alpha I to inhibit adenyl cyclase and thereby withdraw cyclic AMP and presumably suppress PK. And this is the model that's dominated a lot of reinforcement learning and drug addiction for a long time. And these signals to PK are thought to be necessary and sufficient for learning. That's something that we can get back into later. So we wanted to ask, how is dopamine influencing PK? And then do that in a reward-guided learning context to understand how these signals modulate uh, learning and reinforcement. So Suk Jun Lee, who was an MD-PhD student, doing his dissertation in the lab, he's now wrapping up medical school, designed a task in which an animal had to explore an arena and shape its behavior in order to gain a food reward. And so these are food pellets that were delivered here by a receptacle on the left-hand side in this image. And the animal was food restricted, so it was highly motivated to do this task in order to, uh, you know, to get food uh, and, and, uh, and, and not feel hungry, right? And so the task consisted basically of a virtual division of the arena into different components. These are not marked in any way, but the video camera and the processing software basically subdivided the arena into, into these compartments. So there was a zone over here that we're labeling zone one. This is a trigger zone. And the animal had to learn to hang out in this zone for a certain amount of time. And if it spent enough time in that zone, then an LED would turn on. And it had to then run across the arena, do that within a certain time limit, and then again, spend some time in zone two. If it did that, then food would be delivered through this receptacle. So it basically had to hang out near zone one, run, hang out here, and then it could get food. So here's an example of a success trial. I hope this video is playing for you. You can see the mouse over here on the right in the trigger zone. The LED turns on, it runs across quickly. It waits here, it goes right to the receptacle, but it has to wait a little bit of time actually for the pellet to be released. And then it consumes the pellet and goes on. So here's the task structure. First, we have the animal has to enter the trigger zone, has to wait there a certain amount of time. LED has to get to the receptacle zone a certain amount of time, dispense the pellet, and then go to the intertrial interval. And a key thing that Suk Chun did is to limit the number of trials that the animal could engage to 20 per day. So in that way, we had exactly 20 trials every day and simplified a lot of the analysis. And we had a very long interstimulus intertrial inter interval which was at least two minutes, okay? So this gave us a lot of time to look at, uh, to let signals get back to baseline, to look at intertrial effects, and to really cleanly separate different components of dopamine and eventually PK signaling in different parts of the task. So mice do learn the task. Uh, here we can see a success rate progression for a bunch of different mice overlaid as a function of training day. All animals were trained for 11 days. And as I mentioned, only 20 trials per day. So you can see the training, the, the, the learning rate is variable across animals. And here's the summary across this cohort that you see there. Now, because the learning is variable across animals, for each animal, we subdivided its progress into what we called early, mid, and late, which was based on how many successes it would get out of those 20 trials. So when it was down here in terms of the success rate, we called it an early mouse, even if it was all the way out in day seven. Uh, if it was here, it was a mid, and here was a late or expert mouse. Okay, so we tried to look at four, actually we did look at four signals that we thought would be of interest. So first, we looked at the activity of, uh, of DTA, dopaminergic neurons, so now I'm switching to nucleus accumbens and ventral striatum, of VTA, dopaminergic neurons, as measured at the cell body with fiber photometry. We also measured the activity of those axons, again, with fiber photometry and calcium indicators in the accumbens itself. So those are two fibers there. And then we measured the concentration or a, a signal proportional to the concentration of dopamine uh, in the um, nucleus accumbens using D-Light, which had been developed by Lin Tian's lab around that time. And then lastly, we looked at PKA signaling within direct or indirect pathway neurons using a tool that, uh, that was developed in my lab that I'll tell you about more in a minute. So we looked at these four signals of interest, and importantly, we uh, looked at them every day. So through the entire learning process, from the first exposure of the animal to the arena, all the way until it became an expert. And then after it became an expert, we introduced two other kinds of trials 
that will reward emission and LED emission that I'll tell you about in a minute too. Okay, so the animals then had two fibers implanted in them. So for example, here you can see one fiber that's targeting the cell bodies of the VTA that are expressing JRCAM one b This is a red uh, calcium sensitive fluorophore, a red Gecki developed with Canalia. Um, and then uh, we had a second fiber implanted in the nucleus accumbens by which we could record the red signals of these axons that were arriving in the accumbens, as well as D light that was expressed there. So we could look at the activity of the axons, the cell bodies, and the dopamine concentration of this experiment. Okay, so what do these signals look like? Well, here's an example from early in training. And these signals are now aligned in this dashed line to the time of food dispensal, dispense. Dispensing, dispensing. Okay, so this is when food drops into the uh, receptacle, and the animal can then consume it. And so what you see is that early in training, there's a large increase in the somatic GR camp one signal. There's also a large increase in the axonal signal at the same time, and there's a large increase in the dopamine signal measured by D light at the same time. So all of these three are going together. And in fact, in our hands, unlike reports from Josh Burke and others, we do not see any disjunction between the somatic, the axonal signal, or the light. We see these really all tracking together, and we think that one fully explains the other, and we don't really understand at this point the differences with uh, Josh's lab and other reports. Okay, so this is early in training. Now, if we wait to the mid and late phases, we can see that two things happen. One is that this food-evoked response begins to draw, and of course, this is expected because the animal has now learned the task and expects the food to be there. So this is kind of classic RP, which is the reward mode, the reward generated signal gets smaller as that reward becomes expected. But of course, you'll also notice that now there's signal that begins to appear before the food drops here. And so we can look, and I'm sorry, these are only the success trials that are plotted here. So now we can look at that signal that appears before by aligning instead of to the food delivery, but to that cue, to that LED turning on. And so here you can see now using all trials because the outcome doesn't matter. But if we just look at uh, cue alignment, you can see that early on, there's a little bit of a cue evoke signal that's seen again in all three of these signals. And then as we wait for the mid or the late stage animals, then that signal gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the cue evoke signal in all of them gets larger, okay? And so now you'll notice some of you that the food evoke signal seems uh, you know, smaller and that's because it's no longer aligned so it doesn't summate in the same way. And also because there are failure trials included here as well in which there was no reward evoked signal. So basically we're seeing classic RPE here. here. The reward signal goes down as it becomes more predictable. Uh, whereas the Q signal, which is now predictive of reward but whose timing is unexpected by the animal that now generates larger and larger dopamine transits. Now, these effects are clear really on each mouse and each trial. Uh, Sukjun did really a wonderful job of optimizing photometry signals. So as I mentioned, we could image continuously across the whole learning process, but also with good signal to noise so that we could really analyze uh, individual trials and individual animals. So here you can see on the lower left, uh, all trials um, for beginner animals in which we've mark the time of trigger zone entry by the T, the time that the LED turns on uh, three seconds later uh, by the L, the time that the animal now with a variable delay enters the trigger, the receptacle zone as Z, and then the dispensal happens with a fixed time after that, again, three seconds, and then the ITI. And so here you can see that beginner animals show no dopamine transients to entering the trigger zone or to the LED turning on, instead, they only show the dopamine transient when the dispensal drops the uh, drops the, uh, the the pellet, um, and then R here indicates when they actually eat it. These trials are sorted simply by time of them entering the uh, the receptacle zone, and so you can see this is really tightly time locked dopamine signal to the actual delivery of the food. In the intermediate animals, now you can see the emergence of this LED evoke signal is really there in all trials. And you can see that the behavior is becoming tighter, the timing uh, is becoming tighter, uh, and the time between dispensal drop and actually eating is becoming shorter. And in the expert animals now, of course, the Q evoke signal is really dominant, 
And you can notice, you know, just by eye, how much this uh, reward <clears throat> dependent signal is dropping. Okay, so this is the evolution of the dopamine signal with training, <clears throat> the food signal getting smaller as they move from early to mid to late, and the cue signal, you know, getting larger. And as I mentioned, we see this in the somatic GR camp signal, we see it in the axonal GR camp signal, and we see it <clears throat> in the accumbens uh, D like signal. Uh, and they really all share exactly the same properties and look very much like you know, classic RD. Okay, so now I wanna to transition to PKA. And so you know, these RP type signals um, are thought, as I mentioned, to be the ones that regulate uh, learning and they do so presumably via their effects on uh, dopamine receptors. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, forgot, to, forgot to talk about this. Uh, okay, so sorry, I, at this part I've been showing you success trials, uh, which is, and I've shown you how the signal moves from the reward to the queue, but I wanna talk first a little bit about this sort of emission trials to really reinforce the fact that this looks like RP. Okay, so here are emission trials, okay? Um, and these are, uh, um, uh, you can see here the animal, uh, these, are, these are expert animals, and you can see that at the time of the LED being active, there's a really nice dopamine transient, but even though the animal does everything correctly, we've decided to not give it a reward, and we do this, as I mentioned, you know, late once the animals are ready to become an expert. And so you can see that, uh, you know, even though the animal makes it into the receptacle zone, uh, there's no reward signal, that's because we didn't give it a reward, okay? Uh, now we also do a different kind of emission trial, which is very important, which is an LED emission trial. So we actually drop the cue. Now, when we drop the cue very late in learning, the animals sometimes by chance can do the whole routine correctly, even though the LED is not there. Okay, and so they get a reward. It's an unexpected reward because without the cue, they don't really know that they've done it correctly, but they just happen to have run around the cage, you know, in the correct pattern. The frequency of getting this, these is small. You know, we know that the animal needs the LED to do the task correctly at high efficiency, but it does happen, you know, with some, some probability. And so what you can see in these is, of course, there is no LED evoked signal because we didn't turn on the LED at the time that we should have turned on, but there's a reward signal as the animal got the reward. So what do these look like when we quantify them? Well, it's really sort of beautiful RP. So here in green, so these are aligned now to the food dispensal, okay, which tightly aligns this food signal. And so you can see here in green, the normal Q evoked signal, and then the food dispensal signal that comes. And so these are expert animals. So they have, you know, some food evoke response and some Q evoke response. Now in blue overlaid are these reward emission trials in which we just fail to deliver the reward. And what you can see is that at the time that the animal expects it, now dopamine crashes and it drops below baseline. Again, consistent exactly with classic Schultzian, you know, RP. What's really interesting though is these LED emission trials where you can see, well, there's no LED signal. So of course there's no transient at that time that it should have been an LED, but now the food signal is really large. And that's of course, because this was an unexpected signal. So again, really looking a lot like, like RP. And then here on the right, you can simply see a blow up of these signals at the time of food dispensal, really highlighting the opposite signs and the graded effect that we see in dopamine. Okay, so this really looks like classic RP, dopamine transient and the dopamine neuron activity decrease to reward and increase to the cube with learning and then reward emission and also failure trials, which I'm not showing you here, also cause dopamine to fall below the baseline. And you can look at Sutrin's published paper uh, for more details. Okay, so now the question, how does this translate to modulation of PK? And how does it differentially translate to the modulation of PK in direct pathway neurons and indirect pathway neurons? And so one very simple model would be that whenever dopamine goes up, PK increases here and PK drops there. And then conversely, whenever, PK, whenever dopamine goes down, we might expect PK to drop here and to go up there. But if you really think about that, there's a lot of things that are built into that. There are assumptions about saturation or lack of saturation of dopamine receptors. There's assumptions about kinetics of the actions of phosphatases and kinases uh, that are all built into those models. And there are assumptions about affinities of receptors that are built into those models that really have not been tested uh, you know, dynamically in animal doing a 
Now, why did we focus on PK? Well, of course, one is that it's downstream of dopamine receptors, but the other is because this is a kinase that's central to many forms of plasticity uh, that are seen in neurons, including changes in cellular excitability. You know, Jim's lab has done a lot of this uh, on synapses, and Jim's lab and Rick Rubinier and many others uh, have looked at this, Rick, of course, in the hippocampus, not in striatum. There's regulation in MDA receptor calcium influx, there's Anzucan and other people have contributed to this as well. Promote synapse formation, Jenya Kozarovitsky, who uh, worked in, in my lab, uh, built on uh, work that had been done by uh, Hung Bei Kwan uh, years ago. And Jenya showed that in the striatum, uh, dopamine regulation of uh, PKA can influence the activity of, of uh, the ability to generate new synapses. And uh, Jenya is going to be speaking uh, tomorrow. I don't know if she's going to touch you know, on that. Of course, it regulates transcription. There's many people, Jim, like Greenberg and uh, you know, Paul Green, uh, Paul Greengard, Mike Greenberg, Eric Kandel have contributed to this, and lots and lots of other effects of PK. Okay, so PK activity is supposed to mediate reward reinforcement, and generally it's sort of a proactivity, pro plasticity kinase. Uh, and so we want to understand when is it activated? Is it dynamically regulated by behavior? What turns it on? And is it different in direct and indirect pathway models? So Yao Chen, when she had been a postdoc in the lab, developed a uh, fluorescence lifetime PKA sensor, uh, building on the work of Jin Zhang when she had been at Hopkins. Uh, and this is a molecule, it was originally, uh, it was called ACAR, uh, which is a molecule in which there's a, uh, fluoresc a foster resonance energy transfer interaction between two fluorophores that's dependent on phosphorylation of a pseudo substrate of, uh, of PKA that's present in this linker domain. When this is phosphorylated, these two things come together, having a FRET interaction. Uh, and of course, this uh, is, in, this is uh, uh, modulated back and forth by the activity of PK phosphorylating the site, but also by the activity of phosphatases dephosphorylating the site. And so when I say PK today, I really mean sort of net PK activity, which is the balance of phosphorylated versus unphosphorylated uh, substrate. And I'm sorry, I'll be a little bit sloppy and call that. PK activity, although oftentimes I can't really resolve whether there's an increase in PK or a decrease in the phosphatase. Okay. So Yao uh, took the original ACAR and turned it into a fluorescence lifetime recorder, and she used it really beautifully under uh, two-photon uh, excitation to study a variety of different processes. Um, now, the important thing to keep in mind is that when these two um, fluorophores interact, they will, uh, they will uh, reflect a high PK activity, but when they interact, their lifetime is shorter, it goes down. So in all the graphs that you'll see in a moment, you'll see things going down, reflecting PK going up. And so the lifetime in this state here is about two nanoseconds. The lifetime here is about 1.6 nanoseconds. You know, 0.4 nanoseconds doesn't sound like much, but it's actually something that's very easy to resolve. And the way you make these measurements is basically in a pulse manner, you can excite a fluorophore and then essentially start counting and then wait until there's emission of a photon. And by measuring this time between pulse excitation and emission, you can build a histogram of the lifetime of these fluorophores and, uh, and then derive uh, information about PK state. And of course, Ryohei Yasuda, uh, who uh, uh, is really a pioneer in developing these approaches under two photon microscopy. Uh, you know, really sort of paved the way for a lot of these studies. Okay, so here's a histogram of the lifetime of flim ACAR, as we call it, in a baseline state or after activation of PKA by generated cyclic gain P will force one. You can see the curve go from blue, you know, to red, and then we can reverse that by blocking PKA by going uh, uh, back with, uh, with H89. <clears throat> this is now an image uh, in which this color uh, uh, map shows the lifetime. And what you can see is that, uh, is that after we activate forskolin, all these cells really become red, indicating this drop in lifetime, and then it reverses with H89. And as I mentioned, even though these signals are very, very small, they're actually quite easy to quantify. And the changes that are seen here are really robust. This is a very clear decrease uh, in lifetime, reflecting more PK activity and the reversal of H89. Okay, so in slices, 
We can use this to look at activation of uh, dopamine receptors. For example, here's just an unquantified image showing you an effect on lifetime of flim ACAR when we activate D1 receptors in direct pathway neurons. And as expected, you can see that the cell begins to turn red, first the cytoplasm and eventually the nucleus. Uh, and the D1 receptor response is not as big as the maximal response that one would expect uh, with force. Okay, so Yao did a lot of beautiful studies with that, uh, in which I'm not really gonna tell you about uh, today, but instead I wanted you to understand the tool so you could see how we went on to use it uh, in, in vivo. And so uh, Sukjun, uh, who I've mentioned to you before, um, decided to try to use Flim ACAR in vivo through an optical fiber. And so he wanted to look at the bulk activity of PKA in genetically defined striatal neurons, of course, direct pathway versus indirect pathway neurons is the most uh, uh, obvious, and that's where we, where we started, uh, and ask, are these dynamically modulated in a behaving animal? He was greatly helped by uh, Bart Lauder, who was a master's student at the time and now has joined the lab uh, to do a PhD. And as I mentioned, this work is, is published in a, in a couple of papers that have come out over the last couple of years, and so I really encourage you to look at those uh, to, to get some of the details that I'll have to skip today. Okay, so the system basically works by putting an optical fiber into the nucleus accumbens, sending in pulsed one photon excitation through a pulsing blue laser that pulses at 50 megahertz, uh, and then measuring, as I said, the fluorescence output, you know, one photon at a time, measuring the time between each excitation pulse and each output photon, uh, and this is done with something called uh, time correlated single photon counting. And as before, uh, we're going to use the same task and uh, motivate the animal by food restricting it and then giving it food rewards. And as I mentioned, you know, we're going to compare direct and indirect pathway neurons, focusing on this positive coupling of the D1 receptors in direct pathway neurons and the negative coupling of the D2 receptors in the indirect pathway neurons. And we express flim ACAR in either cell type using adeno-associated viruses, preconditional viruses, and transgenic mice that is really standard in the field. Okay, so is PKA modulated? So the first thing we did is just give a hungry animal a food pellet. Forget about the task for a minute, just give it a food pellet and see what happens. And so you can see really nicely here that if we express ACAR phlegm in direct pathway neurons, and I'm gonna call these direct pathway neurons even when they're in the nucleus accumbens, uh, and we're really defining them by D1 receptor uh, expression. So forgive me for calling them direct pathway. I know that terminology doesn't apply as well in the accumbens, but it's just convenient. And so what you can see here is a line to the dash line when we give the animal food that there's a decrease in the lifetime of ACAR phlegm when it's expressed in the direct pathway neurons. And of course, this corresponds to more PK. And so this is what we expect. Oh, sorry, I think I froze there for a moment. This is really what we expect. A food reward increases dopamine, binds to D1 receptors, and increases PK in these cells. And in fact, we can show that that's what's going on here. If we give the animals a D1 receptor antagonist, we can block this response. And if we express a genetically encoded protein uh, PKI, which is an inhibitor of PK that I'll tell you more about later, if we express that in the direct pathway, we can see again that the ACAR phlegm response goes away. We did a bunch of other controls like mutating the phosphorylation site and so forth on the reporter. Uh, and I encourage you to see that uh, in the paper. Now, one thing that really surprised us in doing these experiments is that, you know, by monitoring PK directly in cells, we were able to look at the engagement of these targets in vivo. And, you know, we found that a lot of pharmacology that people use in the periphery to manipulate dopamine receptors centrally really just doesn't work. Uh, and we could look at that directly by PK. So you'll look in the papers, we spent a lot of time working out pharmacology that actually can modulate the PK in vivo. Okay, so uh, the first thing we wanted to see is, you know, can we really modulate PK in the direct and indirect pathway just by changing dopamine? Okay, so again, forget about the task structure for a moment. Here we're gonna use dual fibers again, but we're gonna express in dopamine neurons either a crimson, so an activator, the optogenetic activator, or GTACR2, an optogenetic inhibitor. So that's going to be expressed in the cell body. A fiber present there in the VTA will allow us to turn on or off dopamine neurons. And then we can monitor what happens in the accumbens, first in terms of delight, 
and learn the terms of detail. Okay, so here's the experiment. First, I'm showing you activation of dopaminergic neurons using crimson. What you can see here is the dopamine transient that's evoked in the accumbens by a half second or a one second stimulation of those cells. Uh, this was designed to mimic the size of the spontaneous food reward dopamine transient. And then here you can see the PKA transient that's evoked in the direct pathway neurons by the half second or the one second stimulation. You can see one evokes a small PKA activation and the other one a large PKA activation. This is now the same experiment done with recordings in, in uh, type two dopamine receptor expressing cell indirect pathway neurons. And you can see that the same manipulation, which is increasing dopamine, has no effect whatsoever on PKA response in these cells. So our conclusions from this experiment is that increasing dopamine modulates PKA in direct pathway neurons, but not in direct pathway neurons. And of course, this suggests that type two dopamine receptors actually fully occupy at basal dopamine levels, so that increasing dopamine more has no effect. And we went on to do a lot of different kinds of pharmacological experiments to really nail down this point. And we think this is absolutely true that at least in a mouse, in the core of the accumbens, in this kind of task, basal dopamine is fully saturating the type two dopamine receptors. Okay, now what about the converse experiment? If we now use GTACR2 to inactivate dopamine neurons, <clears throat> here we did even longer inactivations really probe what's going on. And that's because the reward emission typically drops dopamine levels for an extended period of time. So one second, two seconds, or five seconds of inhibition, you can see dopamine progressively decreases to different levels as measured in the accumbens with D-light. These uh, effects have no, these manipulations have no effects on PK signaling in direct pathway neurons. But fortunately, because of light contamination, we couldn't actually measure while uh, the, uh, the, the, the signal was on, we had the blanket, but, uh, but you can see that you know, there is no effect uh, that lasts there. In converse, in the indirect pathway neurons, when we drop dopamine, there's a robust and fast activation of PK in those cells. So in fact, withdrawing dopamine increases PK activity in, in indirect pathway neurons really robustly. So decreasing dopamine modulates PK in the indirect pathway cells, but not the direct pathway cells. And this suggests that the type 1 dopamine receptors are effectively not occupied at all by basal dopamine, such that dropping dopamine more has no effect on PK and direct pathway cells. And again, we did a bunch of pharmacological experiments to really try to nail that down. Okay, so this suggests then that D1 receptors and direct pathway neurons detect only increases in dopamine, whereas D2 receptors and indirect pathway neurons detect only drops in dopamine from basal levels. Of course, this is from the perspective of signaling to PKA, and there could be other effects by beta gamma subunits, so forth, that we would have missed. But what this implies really is that there is no concurrent push pull regulation of PKA in direct and indirect pathway neurons because they detect fundamentally different features of dopamine transients that are going to be engaged at different times in the behavior. Okay, so let's just look at that in a little bit more detail. So let's return now then to this task that Suk Chun uh, designed, okay? And now we're gonna look in the task at how uh, task evoked modulation of dopamine transforms into PK activity. And we're gonna exploit that in this task, there's no laterality of the task. And in fact, Suk Chun went, went on and showed that signals on the right and left hemisphere of the brain are really identical in this task. So because of that, we are able to do lifetime photometry to monitor PK in one side of the brain, and on the other side of the brain, use intensity photometry to monitor another signal, such as D-light, even if both of them are encoded by green fluoropores, as, as was often the case, because uh, the ACAR signal is, is a green fluoropore. Okay, so here in expert animals, you can see the classic RP is like signaling that's invoked when the animal does the task correctly, there's the Q signal, and there's the reward signal, and here's the emission cue signal, and then the crash of dopamine below baseline when the reward is emitted. So what happens in the point of view of PKA? Well, here you can see in a direct pathway, uh, uh, D1 receptor expressing neuron. Um, in red, the Q evokes a PKA signal, and then in, when there's no reward, that signal begins to go down to baseline. Uh, if there is a reward, and there's an additional component of PK that's seen in that cell, 
uh, that's due to this second peak of dopamine that follows when the food is delivered. Okay, so cue and reward evoked dopamine signaling in direct pathway neurons. What about an in indirect pathway? Well, here is a transient that we see when the animal <coughs> um, gets the cue and the food. So this looks like an inhibition of PK. And in fact, it is an inhibition of PK. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Here is the emission trial. You can see that the signal starts to go in this direction, but when the animal fails to get that expected food reward, now uh, dopamine crashes, as seen here, and that leads to an activation of PK in that cell, which has a very similar kinetics and a similar magnitude to the modulation of PK that's seen in the direct pathway. But now remember, this is due to the withdrawal of dopamine, whereas this is due to the exposure to dopamine. Now, this little blip that's here, this is not D2 receptor dependent. We don't know what that is. Remember, I showed you already that if we increase dopamine beyond basal effects, there's no regulation of PK in the indirect pathway neurons. And using pharmacology, we are able to prove that this signal is not D2 receptor dependent. So there's some other pathway that's converging on the indirect pathway neurons, which is increasing PK activity um, when dopamine goes up with the, with the Q and the food, but it's not D2 receptor dependent, and we don't know what it is yet. This signal, of course, which is the crash, is D2 receptor dependent and reflects withdrawal of dopamine. Now, if you think about this a little bit more, it's actually quite interesting, right? Because there's basal dopamine, which is uh, inhibiting adenylocyclase BGI via GI coupling, is doing that basally. But now when dopamine drops, PKA turns on. So that means that something else has to be providing a drive to increase ISBN PK when dopamine drops. And we don't know what that is. It could be phasic activation of another GP star that happens at exactly the same time. For a variety of reasons, we don't think that's true. Instead, it could also be due to a constitutive production of cyclic AMP or activation of PK or a constitutively active GPCR. It's there providing always a push towards activating PK which is normally suppressed by D2 receptors. And then when dopamine drops, that other signal is derepressed and turns on PK. And again, there are things that we need to work out here, but just shows how complex the signaling you know, really is. Bernardo, sorry, five minutes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay, so the key thing though, is that these signals occur in different trials, right? These are success trials. We get activation of PK less than the error trials, but the activation of the indirect pathway PK only happens in these error trials. So do these contribute to learning? Well, the hypothesis is that direct pathway PK may be necessary for early phases of learning when reward evoked dopamine transients are largest and the Q evoked -evoke transients are emerging. Of course, you know an animal experiencing a reward has a dopamine transient even before it learns a task structure. On the other hand, those loss or um, uh, reward omission, whether due to failure or due to experimental manipulation, those loss evoked dips in dopamine are only present once the animal has learned the task structure and is predicting the reward. And so therefore, this indirect path to PK should only matter after this reward prediction errors are learned and failure trials cause a dip, so late in learning. So I'm going to skip our manipulations using PKI. You can look at those in the paper. It largely bears out uh, consistent with the hypotheses that I just posed although the effects on the indirect pathway are very subtle. And I'll point you to a paper that's present in bioarchives now. This is not by Sukjun Lee, but rather by Jay Ong Lee, another grad student in the lab, that really focuses on the function of the indirect pathway and when the indirect pathway becomes relevant to tax behavior. There's a lot of really interesting things there. And if you read that study and this study uh, together, you'll understand what the links are. So let me wrap up then. I hope I've convinced you that dopaminergic neurons are complex that they release at least three neurotransmitters that act on different timescales to trigger a wave of effects that go through the all different kinds of cells in the striatum and have very different temporal domains. The function of GABA and glutamate release from these cells, I would say, is still you know, unclear uh, in vivo in task learning. Specializations of the type 1 and type 2 dopamine receptors make the biochemical effects of dopamine on these two cell classes occur in different trials and in different contexts. Okay, so you should really think about them as things that happen at different times. And these do contribute to different aspects of reward-guided behaviors. 
Uh, this is uh, the lab at, at the time when uh, Sukchun was there. This is Sukchun here. He really was incredible. The amount of work that he was able to get done. Uh, Bart, uh, you know, helped him uh, as well and is continuing on in these studies. He wasn't uh, present uh, in, in, in this picture. Um, and this is Jay Only, whose uh, work I, I really encourage you uh, to look at on, on bioarchives and last year in Nature Neuroscience that touches on this. So thank you very much. So thanks a lot, uh, Bernardo, for the fantastic uh, talk. Uh, we have here a number of questions. So Dennis, uh, I don't know. You want to? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll take it away. Um, let's probably just start with the simplest one. Um, Howard Fields wants to know whether the D light signal in the accumbens was in the core, the shell, or the lateral shell. The core. Cool. Um, so then another question about the, um, I guess, dopamine measurements during the behavior task. So were you able to identify, uh, this is from Ben Benick, um, identify, can you speculate on any differences between the animals that entered the mid or late stages after a few versus many sessions, I guess, because you showed a lot of variability in the behavioral data. Is there any, did you get any correlate maybe of their fast or slow learning? Yeah, that's a great question. And we haven't done that data analysis. We do have that data and, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, potentially we could see that an animal experiences a large dopamine transient early in learning, for example, and that one might be uh, better at progressing through the task structure than the other ones. We, we, you know, we, we have to do that analysis and, and uh, Subjun is actually coming back to the lab this summer for a few months and maybe that's some of the, one of the things that we'll dig into. I'm sorry, I don't have the response. Cool, thanks. Um, and this one is from um, Veronica Alvarez. She's wondering, um, I guess, because you mostly showed the D light signals during that, um, during the reward emission on the task, what happens to the axon G cam signals and the SOMA signals? And then she has a second question, which is a little more speculative. And if we think that dopamine is facilitating the reinforcement learning, what do you, what do you think the role of dopamine is in the expert animals since there's a remaining you know, food yeah, signal. Those are great questions. So many of you may not know, Veronica was the first postdoc in my lab. So pleasure to not see you, hear from you. And thanks for organizing this wonderful uh, session. Uh, so um, so the axonal signal really follows the, uh, the D light signal. I mean, we really don't see any difference. So basically, you know, there's, there's activity, activity of these cells. And so if they all sort of, you know, pause at the same time, we see the G camp or the JR camp signal drop, uh, and it's the same. So we, we see no difference really at all uh, between somatic axonal and D light uh, signals uh, in these cells. So no evidence for local regulation. So what does dopamine do in the direct pathway once the animal is learning the task? I really have no idea. And uh, you know, if we if we blocked you know PKI in those cells in the data that I skipped, we saw that the early learning was affected. But then the animals, of course, did learn, which is not surprising. I mean, this is an animal that's working for its food, right? So you would think that they're going to be other. And we did actually, you know, very, very specific manipulations of blocking really right in the cell in the, in the region that we were looking at. I encourage you to look at that in the paper. And these dopamine transients continue. Once the animal is good, we don't see an effect of PKI there, but yet the dopamine transients are there. So I, I really don't know, Veronica. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see whether it'd be some long-term extinction phenotype if we got rid of that. Uh, but unclear. So, cool, I have thanks. a curiosity, if I can, just, so what do you know about the subcellular compartment specificity of the PKA? So what about differences in, in the special and temporal dynamic in the shaft versus the, the, the spine? Yeah, great question. We don't know, because of course this was not done with imaging. Uh, we're trying to address that a little bit by looking at synaptically targeted PKA. One can, of course, look at nuclear PKA and separate those signals. We haven't done it yet. Uh, uh, Ryohei Yasuda has looked a little bit at spine versus cytoplasmic PKA in a different context in different cells and really didn't see a difference. Uh, now, there's a little bit of something that just keeps bothering me, which is that we don't think that our signals are limited by the kinetics of the reporter. Uh, you'll notice the signals last about 20 seconds. We don't think that's reporter limited, but it's actually really hard to prove. And I think we need to kind of nail that down first before we, we do these other kinds of analysis. Yeah, so there's actually a lot, a lot more questions about the PKA sensing. Um, 
So one is, uh, so cholinergic interneurons said to have both, this person's anonymous, sorry. Um, cholinergic interneurons said to have both D1 like D slash D5 receptors and D2 receptors. So have you tried in these cells? What sort of PK response might you see if you we, did? We haven't done it. Uh, it's on the list of things to do. We haven't done it. Uh, you know, electrophysiologically, we see the response dominated by the D2 receptor effect. But of course, you know, that's GERC, beta gammas, and so forth. So it's a great question. I don't have the answer yet. Uh, I next. think there is, sorry, I just because I've been seeing one which is very interesting, uh, it was scrolling the now, so in relation to co-release, as you mentioned about, uh, I mean, Queen Fan is asking whether GABA or glutamate co-release with dopamine and uh, can I have any modulation effect on the PKA signaling? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I'm really uh, very interested in the idea that the uh, uh, GABA B receptor effects uh, potentially uh, might might be modulating PKA in these cells. Of course, that would be GI coupled uh, in both both places. Um, but I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a fascinating question and one we want to get to. Sorry for so many unknowns. It's just, it's, <laughs> this is where we are. But there were the, the very interesting one, of course. <laughs> you would want to hear about even speculation. <laughs> so yeah. So I, I think that GABA B response might be there. Uh, you know, Nick did some experiments, if I'm remembering correctly, trying to look for a GABA B uh, uh, current in, in, in SPNs and didn't see it, you know, following, uh, following the open release, but, you know, whether they're still signaling to PKA, we, we don't know. Thanks. Um, let's see what the next one. Oh, yeah. Do you think that the D2 independent decrease in PK activity um, could possibly be driven by D1 receptor expression? Jonathan Britt's asking. Um, so increasing dopamine uh, during reward. So at the time of reward, there's a dip in PK activity in the indirect pathway neurons. I don't see how that could be D1 receptor dependent. Um, GS coupled, even if even if topically expressed in, or, or in those few highest bands that might express B1 receptors, I don't see how that would get the right sign. I mean, maybe I'm thinking about it wrong. Um, but yeah, I don't see it. I mean, it could be dynamic regulation of opioid receptors. Uh, that's going to be an easy one to try. Um, you know, of course, there are muscarinic effects more in the direct path than the indirect path. There's so many things to consider. You know, but I don't think it'd be the one. Cool, thanks. Uh, next the ramping question. So the ramping question is there, and, and we do see regulation by ramping. Uh, Sukjun designed some really nice experiments, only upgoing ramps, and those were effective at modulating uh, D1 uh, PKA. Nice. Um, so Jeremy Day says, beautiful talk, Bernardo. Pierre Vincent's group showed a few years ago using striatal slices that dopamine rapidly induces PK nuclear translocation. Mm -hmm. And your tool validation seems to show this as well. Do you have evidence this happens with the physiological changes in, uh, in dopamine in vivo? Yeah. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks. Uh, so there's a great question. Um, and we do have nuclear targeted and nuclear excluded FLIM-A car. So we have the tools to do that, uh, but we haven't, haven't done it. Uh, in the slice, as you noted, we do see that nuclear translocation, and, and, and the act, rather than translocation, I should say, should say we do see nuclear activation or phosphorylation of PKA substrates, um, and we do think that's real and important for transcriptional regulation. We don't know if it happens with endogenously evoked you know, rewards of that time scale, um, but we have the tools. Um, and by the way, if other people want to get into this, you know, it's not that hard to do FLIM now. There's been some beautiful papers that have come out showing other ways of doing uh, FLIM using frequency modulation that look quite robust and you know the tools are all on Agene and, and we're happy to help people you know get going. There's many more questions to be answered than we can possibly address. Cool. So yeah, so I'm going to try to combine this with all the question I had from a few people where so you claim I guess in the beginning that because you don't see an increase in um, or a decrease with uh, P the PKA sensor to dopamine release uh, that the D2 receptors are fully occupied. But then um, because you see this dip, you, you speculate that maybe that's actually a constitutionally active uh, receptor. So do you think that these um, 
dopamine dependent changes you might see in indirect pathway neurons might be due to other uh, aspects of the receptor like internalization or um, uh, you know post translational modifications yeah um, so we are you know doing as, as brief and phasic dopamine signals as possible and of course they are endogenously evoked ones they seem consistent from one repetition to the next repetition. So we don't think that there's a long-term modulation of the dopamine receptors, such as loss of significant receptors to internalization, at least you know, under these conditions. But we haven't looked at that uh, directly. Um, but you know, the stability of the signals would argue, I think, against that. <clears throat> but there does seem to be some you know, drive that's there. And, and I also encourage you to look at the papers because we did a lot of pharmacology. I'm not, I'm, this is not all the evidence. You know, if we give a pharmacological agonist of D2 receptors, we also see no modulation of PK in these cells. So even you know the strongest uh, you know agonist delivery uh, doesn't doesn't do that. Uh, even though that uh, we can look at interactions between agonists and antagonists to prove that our pharmacology is working correctly. Uh, so we really don't think that uh, there's the capability to increase D2 receptor occupancy uh, in vivo. Cool, thanks. And uh, yeah, it's another question from Daniel Trefevsky about the role of adenosine in a, a reward emission trials when um, PK is increased. Um, yeah, so adenosine receptors, of course, are fascinating in these cells. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Yulong Li has made, an aden has made an adenosine sensor so one can look at their modulation. Um, we did show pharmacologically that adenosine receptors coupled to uh, PK in indirect pathway neurons in exactly the way that you would predict, as you stated there for the GLFS. We don't know about their contribution to dynamic signaling in vivo yet. So, Thanks. Uh, Dennis, I'm I'm time. Time. you have to stop here because otherwise we go time. So I really Sounds encourage good. you to continue the discussion in the Slack channel because I can really see a very, very interesting question. So Bernardo and everyone, if you can go on there. And uh, I would like to close the section here and really thanking Bernardo for the great talk and all of you for the attendance and for the nice question. And uh, of course, the bit of discussion that we could uh, have it here today. So I think now we are in the, in the then we have the break and uh, we see all of you at the post session later today. Thanks so much, Rafael, and thanks everyone for the great.